the Cinema Night Podcast. Mike, Travis, Eric, we're way past our bedtime here on a Tuesday night. Everybody go to bed. Get your ass to bed. But we're excited because we're doing the show. Cinema Night Pod at gmail.com. And today's focus, the main event will be, you know, after WrestleMania 40 just went down over the weekend, the main event focus, Mean Gene Oakland style, my Hell best yeah. friend's wedding. Selected by you, Travis. You selected my best friend's wedding, which we will focus on on this very episode a little bit mm-hmm. later. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, how do you feel about it? I feel good. I'm ready to talk about it. We uh, had to push back a couple of days, so, you know, champ of the bit, ready to get talking about this movie. Okay, Eric Branstrom. How you doing, buddy? Uh, good, Michael. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. A little stressed out, a little anxious. I'm going to make the best oh. out of the situation. Like above Eric? your typical, your typical level? Yeah, typical level. I got like wash, like, like knowing that you have to wash clothes and it's already eight. That's panic striking for a forty-three year old man. <laughs> oh. oh shit, man! I'm terror. sorry. <laughs> terror. Yeah, uh, we got an email from Christian. It was basically just a replay of "How's yeah. That Water" from the last episode we did. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize how noisy this thing was. Yeah, it's really got a. Yeah. Here it is again. Oh, good. More of it. You really get that. It's fun, Shogun. I still haven't seen Shogun, Travis. Sorry. That's awesome. I mean, you raved about it on our last episode. Check that out on all podcast platforms. Uh, everybody, by the way, it's our anniversary. Woo! We did it. We did it. Four years. Yeah. And despite some inconsistencies along the way, we're still doing the show. Four still years. That's it. pretty cool. Yeah. It is cool. Good for us. <laughs> Go us. Yeah, man. It's been a pleasure. I love doing this show with you guys, and I'm glad uh, through all the trials and tribulations we stuck it through, and we hope to uh, do something special here. We're on episode 188, so I yep. know we're 12 away from the big 200, our 100th episode. We had a fun time. We brought on the uh, podcast After Dark, guys. Mm-hmm. That was fun. We did The Annihilators, a movie most people don't know. Yeah, we didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> never heard of it at all, and we had a good time. You know, maybe Street Trash is apropos. I don't know what we're going to do yet. <laughs> Everything's oh, in play. That's an idea. Did any of <laughs> us, an idea. Have any of us either had a job that lasted four years? Yes, multiple <laughs> times. Oh. I don't know if I have. Yeah. That's a good question, Eric. <laughs> I don't think I have. <laughs> I worked at the eyeglass place for like six years. Uh, I worked at Temple University for seven years. Okay, wow. Well, um, I can commit. A couple others. I worked at I worked at the beer store in Philadelphia, the foodery. I worked there for six years, five years. Wow, yep. that's impressive. impressive. Wow, I can stick with things, dude. you know. I that's amazing. I, I really, I was trying to think of my teaching career, but that was <laughs> two years and two years. And that was over. And then when I was working in television news, it was ten months, a year, and it was over. So well, penny yeah. <laughs> I never, (laughs) that's actually a fun fact. I actually never worked even a single day at a Bennigan's. That's one of the restaurants I never worked at. I know, right? It's funny. uh, There had to be at least one. Yeah, right. The exception to the rule. Mountain Jacks. Mike Mike has worked at all of them. (laughs) Mountain Jacks. Yeah. You know, Mountain Jacks is, I'm not kidding. Once upon a time, my stepmother's favorite restaurant was Mountain Jacks. Nobody was terrified. Whenever we drive by the sign of the Beef Carver sign and that (laughs) evil looking chef holding the knife. I would be so scared. I have to look away. Sign of the beef carver. Sign of the oh, beef carver. You sent uh, you sent me that video on the history, the fall of Ponderosa. <laughs> Eric, that was great. Yeah, because I worked there dynamic. too. Dynamic. That was a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, documentary. <laughs> it was like a twelve minute bit. This YouTube is filled with these things. Like think of like the most inane or maybe random place that no longer exists or a thing i mean all this materialism we've compiled with our consumerism in this country's history filled with youtube videos about every single one of those things so they'll never be bored we're a self-obsessed culture <laughs> that's putting it mildly wait that's, that's putting, putting it mildly. Putting mildly yes there we go all right Mike, so, you uh, the salad bar at ponderosa <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we. What did I say? Make a salad good by just dumping bacos all over it. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah, that's what you do. Uh, Get that big spoon. You just pour bacos all oh. over it. Oh yeah, that's right. The big bacon spoon. Take one I bite, set it aside, and go get like tacos and mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Travis, did you work at Ponderosa? Fuck no. Okay, I was just double no, checking. I, not a buffet guy. Well, <laughs> I didn't care about the. Yeah, I don't know. We just. 
I forgot that Steve worked there. It was a good reminder. It was me, Brandon, Liberty, Morgan worked there for a minute, and Steve. I forgot about Steve. So, Shout yeah, it was one of those uh, one of those places that the group took over. Like when we took over Blockbuster, <laughs> we invaded. We're like, yeah. we're like locusts. We, we, we took over Food Town. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking Arby's. Yeah, we did it all, man. One of those guys are foot in the door, and then like, ah, I know a buddy who's looking for a job. Next thing you know, (laughs) shitting around. Everybody's smacking (laughs) each other's asses and saying the most vulgar shit possible, probably. Providing bad customer service. Oh, well, man. Well, speaking of bad customer service, let us give it to you straight in the opposite way. Quality movie reviews and suggestions. Our quarantine viewing picks we do every week. So, Travis, uh, what's cooking over there? Okay, so um, what have I watched? I, I guess technically I watched What Happens Later, the new Meg Ryan film that she directed based on a play. It's her. It's a two-hander, just her and David Duchovny. I say I technically watched it because it was one of those things that, like, I was on board. I started it, and it's just the two of them talking the whole time. And, like, a half hour into it or so, I think I like I picked up my phone. The next thing I know, the movie's over. I'm like, oh, I guess oh, I should have been paying better attention. But it's just... It couldn't grab me. I really wanted to give it a shot. Two strong actors, you know. But um, better or worse than the island? Better. <laughs> better. Significantly better. Um, let's see. I watched. Uh, <laughs> oh god. I watched some shitty movies, you guys. I watched a couple of superhero movies that are like big sinners of as far as like recent flops go. And uh, one of them was terrible, and one of them wasn't. The one that was terrible was Aquaman and the Last Lost Kingdom. Uh, oh. That was so fucking bad. Just Ooh. man. Why did they just cancel that? I mean, like it was one of those yeah. things of just like, yeah, I might as well watch it. Why not? You know. And it's, but I mean, uh, they were making yeah. all these changes, right? And why, I mean, the gun comes in, it's the gun verse. Why not just move on from that shit? I, yeah. I, I don't yeah, know. Why. Yeah, but they already made the movie, so that was the last of the of like oh, the okay. old DC run. Which made it Got even it. more kind of stand off. It's like, well, you know, none of this matters now, you know. But it was also just, oof, it was just bad. At one oh. point, um, Aquaman calls his because there's like a, an adventure between him and his brother, who was his enemy in the last episode, in the last movie. And at one point, he calls him Loki. He straight up calls him Loki. I'm like, yeah, we we get what you're going for here. What? Um, yeah, it wasn't great. And then I watched Morbius, which <laughs> I didn't hate. Oh, oh wow. boy. I didn't More hate it. I'm time? not gonna. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that Morbius was a good movie. I, I, that would be ridiculous. And I'm not even. And it wasn't even like so campy and so bad that it was good, because that's not true either. I could just say that for one, I was entertained. Mm, I was. Okay. I was entertained by it, and that says something. Mm-hmm. And for two, it really reminded me of, and clearly was made by people who made, um, like these early two thousands kind of supernatural dark. Uh, adventure, you know, like the underworld and um, huh, like Blade, too. Blade, yeah, all it totally reminded me of Blade. And it's just, I mean, even the fucking CGI looked like it was from that era. The whole thing just smacked of early 2000s in kind of a fun and nostalgic kind of way. I don't know, wow. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not gonna rush to watch it again, but and I'm sure that if I had expectations that it was remotely good, that I probably wouldn't have felt the way I felt about it. But like I said, I mean, I put it on and just kind of had it on and it entertained me which I'll give it that Morbius. Um, I uh, finished up season two of Invincible. There's a lot of love going around for X-Men 97, as there rightly should be. But people, if you are into animated TV shows that have adult-oriented themes and are complex with these rich characters and challenge the viewer with new takes on this old genre... I got to tell you, uh, Invincible is literally one of the best shows on TV. I, I just fucking love it. It's so rich. It's just there's so much there. I love it. Um, strongly recommend Invincible. <sighs> Wasn't crazy about the boys in the boat. George, Cl- George Clooney's recent directing. Another dud. Uh-oh. Yeah, George. you know, it starts off strong. It's like set in the 1930s. The main character is like living in a shanty town, and he's trying to get work somehow so he like find it's a true story and he like finds work on a like he tries out for a rowing crew at the local university that he's you know, about to get kicked out of because he can't afford to pay tuition and then it, it starts off good but man by the end of it it's like oh, this just kind of did exactly what you expected it to do didn't didn't you know nothing nothing really happened there i, I can't really suggest the boys in the boat oh. i will suggest yeah i'll suggest invincible season two 
And I once again showed my students one of the greatest movies of all time. And you know you love a movie if you've shown it to your students over and over again. Because when I show this movie to my students, it means I watch a half of hour, had like a half hour, 40 minutes of it with my first hour, then that same block again with my second hour, and that same block again with my fourth, and that same block again with my fifth. So I teach economics. And I showed them The Grapes of Wrath again, which <laughs> is just fucking... If you've never seen it, do yourself a favor. Watch The Grapes of Wrath. It is a masterpiece. I would like to. Yeah, it's, I should. It's on YouTube right now, and it's uh, my own. I'm going to pull an all-nighter. That's what I'm going to do. It's worth Fuck it. It's a great movie. It's a great movie. Is it John Houston? John Ford. John Ford. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of Johns yeah. back John then. Ford and, and Henry John. Fonda. I mean, in my, for my money, Henry mm-hmm. Fonda is in, like, two of the best movies of all time. And this one and 12 Angry Men. And, uh hmm. Yeah. Did you ever see The Wrong Man, a Hitchcock movie he did with Henry Fonda? Mm-mm. That's a cool-ass movie. I should Try check to find it out. That if you're on a Fonda kick. Huh. Um, okay, I keep forgetting about the issue I want to bring up about X-Men 97 because I've been loving this season. But I'm scratching my head here. Like, they bring the they bring back the X-Men, essentially. Um mm. Gambit? Why? Why? Yeah. Like, what? why is Feige doing this now? When I thought he was prepping the the X Men to come back into the MCU, it's kind of like when that happens, I'm gonna be like, "Well, I'm happy with this being like the X Men coming back. Like, I'm gonna feel like I've I've already blown the load on like that whole like that whole Ew. team and everything." Ew, yummy. Um, you know what I'm getting at here? It's like if you're gonna like you could have saved all that nostalgia and come back, kind of like make representations of all of those characters from the X-Men cartoon series in the movie and stay away from like what you already did with the X-Men and like then you can have like that fun nostalgic feeling it seems like they're just dumping this and being like okay then we're going to do it again all over again in a couple of years I, well, I don't know but that's I mean that's what they do though they have so many characters and they bring them back periodically such as the Fantastic Four right my, my thinking is <laughs> um, I mean it's still going to be probably another well we got Deadpool coming out this year but and so I think we're obviously going to see some mutants and some kind of introduction of them into the MCU there, probably. But in terms of getting them regularly and straight up seeing the X Men, I I imagine it'll be another two, three years or longer before we really get in the full swing of that. I would think. Mm. So um, I think that he's just kind of you know put the pot on to boil, so to speak, and just kind of like prepping the audience and just kind of like getting us excited about X Men again. And getting people ready to see that kind of stuff. I mean, some people will feel like you will, and that's probably because you're just not really into the live action Marvel scene. And well, the MCU, I should say more specifically. And uh, yeah. that's that's fine. That's you. That's you. You do that. But I think most people will will just be excited to see more in, more incarnations of characters they love. Uh, our pal Aaron Judd Bud, Judd Bud has uh, been on the show before. He did a. Uh, the Brotherhood of the Wolf. That's an episode we did. That was a long time ago. Yeah. And yeah. he went and watched all the X-Men in order from the original 2000, all the movies, even with the, oh. <laughs> even with the origins, Wolverine, yeah. the terrible Deadpool yeah. fail. Weapon, I did that during uh, COVID. Yeah. He said, these movies suck. All of them. I was like, yeah, I guess you're <laughs> not even like, like, so the last set of movies here from 2011 X-Men first class up until Trash Phoenix uh, first class was good, I thought, but then uh, other than that, the rest of them just kind of got worse and worse in the modern version, and then the 2000s version, really two was the only one I liked. Three was a fucking disaster with Brett Ratner, of all people, so yeah, yeah. there's the, we are due for some good X-Men films. We need an X-Men film that is worthy. Logan. I mean, Logan is a worthy X-Men film, That's but, true. It's, but it also kind of stands off in like this weird future, like alternate existence. It's a, it's a weird kind of one-off kind of movie. It's but a great I movie, also, yeah. I also like New Mutants. I know a lot of people shit on it, but I thought New Mutants was pretty good. So I didn't hate it, but yeah, it wasn't great. I'm not rushing to watch it again. But it's still it was, a bar we can hit. It yes. wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't quite there, but it wasn't that long ago. I guess is what I'm saying. Madeline Stowe popped up again on my screen when I was on Tubi, and I hit play immediately. Of course, <laughs> well, monkey for uh, China Moon, 1994 oh. uh, noir film with her yeah. and uh, Ed Harris. Benicio del Toro in an yeah. early role. Shit, I used to love that movie uh, back in the day. This is a fucking great thriller. I bet. This is oh. a solid thriller. It really reminded me of those Ford 1940s noir thrillers. It was it was good, and I, I, this filmmaker I didn't see much from at all after that. But yeah, go back because that uh, that that definitely holds up. It's solid. 
Ed Harris is revisit. fucking fantastic in it. Really, I'll uh, revisit. Tough yeah, situation for that character. Just, uh, just a real shitty situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the Flintstones, the Flintstones. I turned Fuck. it on. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Like, I'm bored. I, I got the yeah. kids. I'm like, well, I got to watch something that's not, you know, Moana for the 30th time. I'm turning on the Flintstones. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What what a colossal waste of money. <laughs> like, this is a this is like a true disaster. No like, bullshit. I, I don't know what they were thinking. I'm watching this with my jaw on the floor. Like, what a waste of money. <laughs> like, oh, what a waste of money. <laughs> what a waste of money. What a waste of money. I could not believe my eyes. Like, the story is horrible and like when you watch the credit like there's like 50 screenwriters on it of course and it's course. just such a goddamn mess it's one of like the worst movies i've ever seen it's not fun at all <laughs> everybody's trying way too hard john goodman is cringe inducing rick moran it's so bad cool but the flintstone sucks overall too that's the other thing i've learned that i know it's just a cartoon but it's a cartoon the laugh track the, the original cartoon sucks ass so the movie's not gonna be good either the flintstones Really lame stuff. It just is. <laughs> fun theme song, fun premise. Oh not yeah, a good show. Yeah, that's yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it never had a chance. It never had a chance. Sold cigarettes. Um, well, they were good at selling cigarettes. <laughs> Coke. <laughs> yeah. Um. So last night I'm on Netflix and I see Mel Gibson and I'm like, you know what? God damn it, let's give this a try, man. Because I haven't seen him since Dragged Across Concrete. So I gave this movie a shot on the line. Oh my God, he's a shock jock, and yeah. he gets a call. He gets a call that comes in from this nut, and this <laughs> nut wants to play a game with Mel Gibson. It's that's, that's Money Monster just on the radio. <laughs> yep. yep, he makes it real well known that you got to play by the fucking rules or somebody's going to get killed. <laughs> and he's like, you son of a bitch, you fucking, <laughs> you asshole. Bring me Mel back Gibson my son. Getting Wait pissed. a minute. No, no, it's like grizzly bear head getting pissed and yelling. <laughs> a lot of uptight shots, close shots of that face. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, so yep. many wrinkles and folds. Yep. Um, Dude, that is really funny for some reason. But is it better or worse than Airheads? I bet Airheads is better. I bet it is, too. Well, I mean, it's talk radio. I mean, this is the exact same yeah, that's exactly what I was as thinking. talk radio. While I'm watching it, I'm like... And she says, and she says like, oh, this is a good premise, but this is God off. And I'm like, this premise is talk radio, a fantastic <laughs> film. James Woods. This, I'm, I almost would encourage you to see it because it's bonkers. Like this ending <laughs> will make your head spin. And I didn't know whether to burst out laughing or tip my hat to it uh, mm -hmm. when all was said and done. Like if you've seen it, it basically rips off a very underseen 80s slasher movie. Uh, and it's ending, but I don't know. I, I Sleepaway camp? Might, you, you might not, no, not sleepaway camp. <laughs> you might have no dicks. You, you might have to take a look. I mean, see it for the laughs of Mel Gibson's screaming face. But stick around. I, I wonder what you'd think about this, man. Um, yeah, on the line. Uh, and I think <laughs> I think that's it, man. I think that's it. Hmm. All right. Well. Uh, I saw a movie that I always mix up with hackers called Slackers. Mm -hmm. They just, it's the title. It just got me, you know? It's fucking terrible. It's got Devin Sauer. And you got Jason Schwartzman in his worst role of his career, hands down. It's the worst performance and worst role of Jason Schwartzman's career. There's no doubt about Destroyed it. Destroyed City. I want to say Morphine yeah. was like heavy on the soundtrack, right? Uh, I don't, I didn't notice any. It came out in 2002. So, so maybe I'm thinking of a different. Maybe band. hackers has more morphine. <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it it wasn't good. Um, Jason Siegel did it too. There's some good people who know how to act and be funny, yeah. and it's not. So yeah. uh, also very bizarre that fucking. It's always it's a weird Hollywood moment that uh, Mimi Van Doren's in it. And she's like seventy something, and yeah. Jason Schwartzman plays with her tits, her bare topless tits, in a hospital bed for like two minutes. It's so fucking weird. It's totally real though. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Fucking bizarre as hell. It makes and there's no a lot sense. of things. There's a lot of things you could have said next, but two minutes of Jason <laughs> Schwartzman playing with Mimi Van Doren's tits is not something yes! I thought you were gonna say. I hear you. I didn't see I that knew. coming. Jesus wow. Lord. Yeah. Wow, dude. <laughs> so 
I had seen the first two seasons of Barry like four years ago when it was out, oh, yes, and finally. I didn't finish it. I didn't finish it until now. And boy, the, I loved those first two seasons, and I went back and watched them again. They were awesome. Season three is pretty good, but season four fucking sucks. The show ended poorly. I thought oh, it was very shit. disappointing. Oh, oh I yeah, completely. I was thinking of you because I know that shit. you were you were down with it. You were really oh, yeah. pleased, right? I, I loved every season. I thought it was really solid oh. throughout. They, the premise and the writing of the show was so good. Maybe it was too high a bar to maintain it, but maybe it was also just they didn't know where to go because the show was walking this very f- difficult line of violence, and hardcore, triggering, traumatic shit, and comedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actors, you know, whenever you have a movie or a show where actors are being actors, it's always dangerous it could go real bad real quick and i don't think it yeah, did actors, in the show but actors playing actors yeah yeah um I, henry I, winkler's incredible he's incredible without any spoilers there is a, there's a time jump and i guess i'm guessing that yes. you're kind of talking about that mm-hmm. okay okay oh, i can under i can understand that um i can i can appreciate that um that's that's kind of it, it's late in the show for something that dramatic but man for me the direction alone i mean i just think that i think that bill Hader is an incredible director Oh, especially yeah. when it comes to ac- action sequences and is it his ability to draw your attention to different parts of the screen with barely any movement but just placement i think he's one of the most underappreciated directors right now working i wouldn't disagree with that at all bill Hader may be the most talented person working in hollywood today no bullshit. He's- i wouldn't argue against it he's incredible writing directing acting comedy yeah. serious he can do it all man you gotta watch he- barry yeah, Barry is a, he, just because it fell apart for me doesn't mean Barry sucked. The show is incredible. I'm so glad I got to watch it again. And there's a lot of characters. Stephen Root. I mean, that Dude, time jump thing. Just performance of his up. career. Performance I, of Stephen yeah. Root's career. Oh my god, that's Absolutely. saying something. I yeah. wouldn't disagree with that. And I Henry Winkler. Not. Henry Winkler agrees. Oh yeah, both of those. That's a no doubt for me. Both those guys is the best work they ever did. Winkler to me, that's his finest. This is his finest hour. It's the and, best work Hater's done acting too. Yeah. And it introduced us to uh, what's his name? I always forget his name. That bald dude. Oh, who's no, ho Hank. A- Anthony, yeah. uh, Anthony, something or other. He's he's outstanding. Just really, no, just, ho just, Hank. Yeah, no, ho Hank is quite a lovable character. You know, Travis, I'm really love when I don't have things clearly laid out for me. I I talk about this a lot, and so I don't need it to be spoon fed to me. But it just didn't work very well with that transition that you mentioned. That, yeah. That's all I'm going to say about I that. For now. I just it's like. Good show it's overall, but I guess I could see that not working for everybody, but still worth seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Fucking incredible show, no doubt. Make your own final judgments. And then uh, I also went back to HBO a few years before that. You know, I've really been like reliving the 2010s on HBO, which was an incredible time with Game of Thrones. Barry is at the tail end there. And of course, Kirby Enthusiasm was around a little bit. And Silicon Valley, which I mentioned recently. And also Girls. Remember that show, Girls? That really happened. It, it was a phenomenon, but I never saw it. And you never saw it? Mm-mm. Oh, I'm surprised. I don't know why I'm surprised, but I I watched the first couple seasons, and then there's six seasons total, so I'm, I've am i been watching it nonstop. And like Lena Dunham. She was huge. She had the show, and now she d- doesn't exist. I'm not really sure what happened there, other than maybe she didn't want to be in the limelight. I know she had some issues with addiction, but it seemed like she was one of those people that she couldn't tweet or like post on Instagram without it becoming like a news story. And like everyone mm. had an opinion. She was yeah. like this pilloried woman for some reason. Um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if she was like, fuck this society's dumb and, re- and like retreated. <laughs> it's also curious because the show ends right when me too started. So <laughs> it, it just seems like that show would have been, it's, I'm actually glad it went that way because the show was already setting the table for a lot of things to show us what... I mean, people who are in their 20s are very self-involved. The show crushes that. Uh, they're also uh, dicks. They're cruel. Uh, they're in agony. I think the show does a great job of representing what it's like to be somebody in your 20s living in New York City, which I fucking hate. I fucking hate that New York City's got all this love and attention over and over again. I will give the show credit, though, because Lena's character is from Michigan, and her parents are from Michigan, uh, with our old bosom buddy pal playing her dad, that guy with Tom Hanks, uh, Scolari. He's the dad. Oh, wow. That's fun. Yeah, he's there. R. R. Oh, R. shit. 
so long, Mr. Scaleri. But uh, I think it's a show you definitely check out if you missed it. It's a great time to dive in and kind of look at it now that it's been over for about seven plus years. Mm. It's and it's intriguing to me. I, I find it fascinating. I also know that there was uh, complaints about the show not being representative enough. It was like it wasn't Friends level in terms of like just all white people in New York City. But uh, some people got pissed about that. I don't know if it was that bad, but I do know that it's Adam Driver. You can see Adam Driver kind of. Mm. Take yeah, that was off. where you got to start, right? That was pretty yeah. much it. Yeah. That's cool to see now because of where his career arc has kind of gone, you know, trying to pull off a Star Wars villain, which was impossible. Mm-hmm. Like, he wasn't bad in Star Wars. I think he it just was a sh- Yeah, it wasn't yeah. his fault. Thank you, Stas. Just a shitty trilogy. That's all. So yeah. check out Girls. Give it a look. Adam Driver. Also, one of my favorite characters to date, the guy who plays Ray on that show is fucking hilarious. <laughs> I just laugh so hard at that dude. He's, I don't know his name. I, I haven't seen him in anything else, but... Good job, guy who played Ray on Girls. And uh, uh, hate to be yeah. a burst your bubble there, but ooh, that, that Lena Dunham's canceled, bro. Oh, oh is that what canceled? she went away? Racially, insen- racially insensitive comments. Oh no! Oh, I, I, that must, I thought you were letting the air out of your bike tires. I guess that was you reading that. <laughs> yeah, and there's a yeah, it's long. Oh really? So, 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 so yeah. Said some dumb things. So yeah, okay. So I was partially right. She said things. People got upset. I guess. Some of them with good reason. <laughs> yeah, I guess she doesn't deserve to be alive anymore. So, yeah, let's just go ahead and drop her head well, off. She, she doesn't, she's been canceled. She no longer exists. That's what happens when you've been canceled. That's uh, right. Unless you're Matt Lauer, who's working on a comeback, apparently. Good luck hey! with that. Matt. Yeah, I heard he was at Don Lemon's wedding. Exciting <laughs> yeah, times. Heard about that. Good luck with that. <sighs> All right. Well, you know, check out your own stories. Research things. If you heard someone's canceled, look into it. Maybe... Give it a little nuance first and don't just assume what you've heard. I'm going to do that later. I will, but I'm not saying that Eric is making anything up. I'm just getting pretty sensitive about that shit. It's just getting so intense. But that doesn't mean we can't all be friends here on the Cinema Night Podcast. Yay! So, Travis, we are going to do your movie now. We are going to lock in on 1997's My Best Friend's Wedding, starring Julia Roberts, Cameron Diaz, Dermot, of course. (laughs) Dermot. Uh, I never saw this movie, but Travis, you have a memory of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, this is one I saw a ton. Um, a ton? Yeah. It was. We, it, there was a box copy in the house, and uh, I believe I saw it in theaters. And, you know, I have a um, a love for romantic comedies. I always have. I was, I've always been into Nora Ephron and all that Made kind Manhattan. of stuff. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> we did watch that together. Famously bad movie. <laughs> Um, but the 1990s was maybe the in like the mid early to mid 1990s was really like the last gasp of romantic comedies in in my opinion, and this was one of the prominent ones from that time period. And I was you know I watched movies a lot with my family and my brother was gone a lot, so that was like me and my sister and me and my mom a lot. So we you know we watched stuff like this together. And um, but I can't say like I only watched it that with, with them by any means. I would throw this movie in. All the time, all the time, in the, the in nineteen ninety seven through like two thousand one or whatever, so it was a staple for a while, and it is one that I've wanted to do on the show for some time because I have not seen it for a long time, but I remembered it well, pretty well, and I remembered that it is an unconventional romantic comedy. I thought it might be worth taking a look at, which I think it was. Eric, uh, do you have a memory the first time or no? He just saw listen, listen, I love Julia Roberts, but this is in the this was this came out in the Julia Roberts slump. I mean, who could forget Mary Riley? <laughs> yes, Mary Riley. Riley. Yes, that mom was not long after. Great yeah. call out. Yeah, this, yeah. this was like uh, this is before <laughs> Brockovich. Notting Hill. Uh, yeah, this is the slump. This is I love trouble. Mary Riley. No, no, this was a, this was not this was a big hit. I mean, yeah, yeah. After no, this this is what brought her back. But like, there was a yeah. slump where theory. she was. Everyone was like, "Where's Julia Roberts?" Uh, with Mary Riley, I love trouble. Like some other piece of shit. And then this came out, and, then, and she was back, and everyone was yeah. happy again. Yeah. Uh, and yet, I, and yet I still. <laughs> And I still missed it. I mean, uh, I don't know how. Oh. I mean, I'd love this is prime Julia Roberts. I love Julia Roberts. I love yeah. romantic comedies. I just always, I just always missed it, man. Just didn't wow. appeal to you, huh? I did. I just missed it. <laughs> we, we just missed this time. Yeah. <laughs> we both just missed it, Eric. Okay, it's interesting. Again, this show never fails to surprise me or surprise any of us about what we've seen, what we haven't seen. It's always Mary a fascinating Riley. part of this experience. Like Barry Riley, which I never. 
never saw. But I, <laughs> I saw it. It's not oh, it's horrible. It's so bad. It's not good. Was the commercial even just? Was that good all the commercial was? Good production design. That's it. That's it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that is so funny. That's a great deep cut, Eric. Nice job. Great white buffalo, Mary Ryan. <laughs> all right. So if this is a popular rom com, what's the rating, gentlemen? IMDb style. Mm, I'm gonna say pretty high. I'm gonna say not huge. High. I'm gonna say seven point three. You know what, Travis? I think uh, I'm going to agree with that rating. Yeah. Oh, okay. He's going to join you on 7.3. Loud. I will say this is like a 6.7, just like average right down the middle. No big deal. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Oh, 6.3, even lower. Oh, wow. wow. A, lot lower, and, a lot lower than I would have guessed. Yeah, a whole point lower uh, with 155,000 ratings. So people are... It's declining in popularity right now. It's down 87 <laughs> spots. Going down to number 87 this week, 2,331. Dear Casey. Uh, <laughs> 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 Looking ponderous, man. Casey Case from uh, Mary Riley Everton. You know the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but do you know about his maid? This week on The Countdown, Mary Riley. <laughs> but do you know about his maid? <laughs> God damn, that's fucking hilarious. So there you go. That's the uh, rating on that as far as uh, Rotten Tomatoes. You know, maybe you would say to yourself, hmm, critics, were they friends of rom-coms? Because at this point, like you said, Travis, <laughs> it was 1997, and You Got Mail was come out the year after this, and that mm-hmm. was preceded, of course, by Sleepless in Seattle, which really, I mean, that, did, that really was the one, right? Or was it Harry Met Sally first? I don't know. I when Harry Met Sally was first, and that was 89, and that was uh, kind of like set off that whole spiel of romantic comedies and then probably you got mail was like the last so true but one. this is 1997 we got the gay best friend maybe critics <laughs> turn their back on this this is controversial so, same year that maybe. ellen came out on live on tv that year so. that's right just saying just for uh, who could forget TV. couldn't could not it was, it well, the only thing deal. i wish i could forget is that uh, she wasn't a terrible human being in the end but hey you know that's the way it goes Talk canceled <laughs> Congratulations, folks. Uh, we got a 74 on the thermometer from the critics. Oh. That's a rock solid score. And a 7.3. That's a, almost a dead heat. 74 to 73. Okay. Uh, different than the INDB rating. I don't know. Yeah. I was closer on the Rotten Tomatoes guess if I was guessing that way. You were. You both were. You know, somebody, we should commission a study to understand <laughs> what the variables are between Rotten Tomatoes ratings and Well, I think IMDb. that. IMDb gets a lot more ratings, I would assume, because the app is just there. It's just a lot more. I mean, does, does Rotten Tomatoes even have a fucking app? Yeah, you know, I just thought, as soon as you said that, I'm questioning that. I don't know. Right. So I never used it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it does. Well, which one's more corrupt? <laughs> IMDb, I think. <laughs> oh, no. All right, as far as those reviews. What about Owen Gleiberman from Entertainment Weekly? Mm-hmm. Gleiberman. Gleiberman. We don't feel much of anything. <laughs> no. Is he is he at his therapist? Is he talking about the movie? Is he just dead inside? Yeah. Is it the royal it weed, the editorial? <laughs> the royal weed. Uh, Rita Kempley from the Washington Post. In 2002, she said the following. A misbegotten attempt to update the genre that only proves the enduring, if not downright, inviolable. 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 Oh, that's weird. I don't know that word. What does that mean? In, in, inviolable or inviolable? Inviolable. 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 Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I mean, Anyways. I've heard it said. Luke would know. Steve would know. Take it to <laughs> yeah, right uh, the other podcast. Yeah, take it to Guy. Yeah, Steve's Email pissed right Steve. now. Yeah, yeah, he already knows. He's take screaming it to your right now. <laughs> your entomologist. Uh, appeal of the, the boy meets girl scenario. Okay, so a misbegotten attempt to update the genre that only proves the enduring, if not right, downright invaluable appeal of the boy meets girl scenario. Okay, thanks. That was helpful. Uh, Peter Travers of Rolling Stone said, Roberts puts her heart into this one. Audiences are likely to return the favor. Oh, well, that's fun. Roger Ebert, once upon a time. Oh, speaking of Roberts, I'm sorry, I have to interject to correct the statement. It wasn't, um, at, at the last gasp was of romantic comedies, wasn't You've Got Mail, it was America's Sweethearts. I actually thought of that while you were talking, but I didn't bring it up. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I you know that as well as I. I sure do. All right, carry on. So uh, Roger said, the screenplay right. has never been on autopilot. It just fooled us into thinking it was. 
in order to sneak up on the unpredictability. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Complex review. It was. Got a little, little witch mouth, but I think I get his yeah. point. I was hoping we'd see some Destin Thompson, but mm. not seeing it. Destinless. <laughs> Destinless. Mm. In a film review. Uh, how about David N. Butterworth of rec.arts.movies.reviews? Uh, an, e- an uneasy mix of well-realized humor and unrealized sadness. Sad movie? This movie sad? It has some sadness to it, I think. But it has some joy. Yeah, a very serious moment with Paul Giamatti in the hallway. <laughs> this too shall pass. Smoking. Rebel. Yeah. Thank you, Pig Vomit. Same years, <laughs> private parts. Yeah, wow. Right. 97 was a big year. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yeah, uh, Stanley Kaufman, The New Republic, also said, a farce comedy, it must thrive if it's to do so on Sparkle. But the bubbles are sparse, partly because of Robert's low fizz level. Soda pops. What in the fuck is he? What, 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 huh? Was he high? <laughs> he's going what all the way this? in on the bubbles and the soda. And he's not pulling out. <laughs> <laughs> Just beating the shit out of that metaphor. Jesus. <laughs> All right, so that was awful. yeah, it's a rom com, but it's not your typical rom com, Travis. You kind of alluded to yeah, that in the beginning of this. That's all it is. I mean, that, this movie to me, watching this movie, what I kept thinking of, and I've thought of this before, it makes me think of Talented Mr. Ripley a little bit because you're following oh. the antagonist in a lot of ways, and you're seeing someone like present one face while in fact they're trying to undermine the the people that are who should be our heroes um yeah so it, it's a uh, it's a different take it's a, it's a it is dark it's a, i mean i think that's why maybe that's partly why the uh imdb score is a little bit low i could see a lot of people seeing this movie being like fuck her and uh you know like, why am i supposed to care yeah. about this person why would i like this person why would i have any empathy for this totally human character <laughs> oh man i mean those are some really good points um I don't know. The charisma of Julia Roberts takes over everything that uh, I would have negativity about. I mean, mm. I just uh, I can't not like her. I, I feel bad for her in her own personal situation. Her truth. I feel for <clears throat> her. I mean, it's mm. hard being in love and have it unrequited in general. Oh. But when you find out the person you love is about to be married, sure, this is classic romantic comedy stuff. I don't know what everyone's talking about. This is a classic romantic Philadelphia story. Well, it is um, classic, but there's some spins on it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. But the thing about it is, if they made Kim a, like a bitch, like it would be more palatable. But Kim's right. perfectly nice and sweet. She's just yeah. very different from Juliet. Well, first off, this movie's directed by someone named P.J. Hogan. P.J. Hogan. Who did little after. Yeah, Peter Pan, he <laughs> fucked the studio and they, <laughs> they severed ties. Muriel's yeah. Wedding, he was the writer on that one. Remember yeah. that one? Yes. Yeah, got, I mean, I never saw it, but I remember it got Kate Blanchett or no, uh, Tony Collette's career off the ground, as I recall. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. The movie opens bizarrely with this choreographed song yeah. of mm. women. Uh, it's supposed to be some type of. <laughs> I don't, it's weird. Trying to exp- yeah, it is weird. They're trying to express some point that, hey, women got to get married and society's telling them this is the way it should be with this song being very vanilla and typical but it's also dripping with satire itself <laughs> yeah so uh it's also by the way uh jerry zucker was involved in this film right he was one oh. of the people who uh no shit had a hand in this but it, it opening surprised me i was like what the fuck is going on it really freaked me out for a minute i was <laughs> i was totally taken by surprise but i also yeah. felt like right away it was very hey this is the point of view of women but from a boomer male perspective okay um, oh. I I definitely used to skip that as a kid growing up. Fast <laughs> I fucking hated that. I would fast forward through it every time, you know. But I yeah. guess I needed to sit down with a pen and paper and think about it like I did watching it the other night because I finally figured out what's going on with that. And it's apparent now, and maybe it was apparent to you guys on your first viewing, but, like, this is a musical. This is a musical. It has five separate musical numbers in it. Um, Dionne Warwick. Two of which... Yep, Burbank two of which are distinct pullaways into completely like separate kind of surrealities. And the first one is that one. Um, it, these are not our characters. These are not actors that we see again in the film. 
This is just like a little performance, a little presentation to like warm us up and be like, hey, there's going to be some kind of weird random asides in this movie that in a lot of ways takes like a somewhat realistic approach a lot of times. And then it'll pull you out every now and then and be like, hey, the, we're, we're fucking in La La Land now. The karaoke scene, which yep, is that was one of them. The, and then, uh, of course, M.M. at Walsh just jumping in there. <laughs> Rest in peace, Mr. Walsh. So long. Um, yeah, we had him and Philip Bosco, two oh, legends, Bosco. side by side in one scene. Both passed. Uh, yeah, I, I, I loved the opening. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. And I was hoping this was actually a musical throughout the entire movie because I'm like, I'm loving what the, was going on here. Then I started scratching my head like when like nothing like that happened again. And I did uh, go back and I'm like, why, why the fuck did they do that? I think, <laughs> to me, it makes sense because I think what they do right off the bat is romanticize marriage in general mm-hmm. as this like thing that no one really takes seriously it's just like this happenstance event that no one really thinks through in fact i think uh michael says that at one point like uh he got caught up in the moment and the momentum <laughs> yeah of this thing that is, no one really takes seriously uh even yeah anybody that's been married a long time will tell you that uh they i don't know i shouldn't say this but you really got to think it through before you uh, you tie the knot because it's not a fucking fly by night thing that you should discard easily. It's 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 a big thing, and I think mm-hmm. this opening kind of satirizes it nice, ni- nicely. Uh, but the movie goes from that, and everything that starts off the beginning is so cheesy it's so telegraphed oh there's this guy we made a promise to each other at 28 but was it real oh guess what i think he's gonna propose to me let's set you up for that bullshit oh no he's actually gonna get married to someone else oh no what a shocker but that sets up the whole thing perfectly because she starts the movie starts and she's like worried she's like oh god i think this fucking guy is gonna try Mm -hmm. and propose to me and like she gets on the phone with him she's already trying to deflect like from the start she's like oh yeah yeah you know like we were kids and he, like that's not where he's going he doesn't and you get to see and you're talking about julia roberts charisma like mm. the subtlety of her facial expressions throughout this movie oh, so just gorgeous. incredible there's so much given in terms of acting so like that telephone scene where she's sitting on the bed and it starts off and you can see her like trying to play him off like oh god he's gonna try and propose and then it's like oh he met someone and she's trying to like minimize that like oh it's not a big deal and then like quickly becomes concerned and she's mm-hmm. trying to like what the fuck and then she's immediately like i i can't have the one thing that i never wanted <laughs> and again that's like so human about her she says later in the movie she's like well you know I, he's so wonderful why didn't i know that when i could have had him how many people have done that how common is that kind of attitude with i mean that happens all the time it's happened to me many times i've done it to others it's just part of life and um it, yeah. We pretend in film like that kind of thing doesn't take place because it's kind of ugly. But instead, <laughs> Ronald Bass, our screenwriter here, has like oh, made boy. that front and center about this character, which I respect. Yeah, yeah. Then, and I like how she's called on it too because I think uh, who calls her out on like the territorialism of her decision to try to pursue Rupert, that relationship Rupert Rupert. again? Yeah, I like that Rupert. quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, right through the whole thing. So. Okay, so then this wedding's gonna go down. It go four days. It's gonna happen. Get ready, settle in. <laughs> got ticking okay, clock. Watch cliche out. as fuck. And then you've got this <laughs> Cameron Diaz character. Hey, guess what? Uh, my best, you know, my maid of honor. She fell off a cliff or something. So you're the maid of honor now. <laughs> like, come the fuck on. It was just these stupid, ridiculous, impossible leaps that were taking me out of the movie. I'm like, this is so fucking cliche. That's where I started in that point. I was getting really frustrated. Because I thought, is this Runaway Bride? What's the difference between Runaway Bride? I've never seen that movie either. I have no idea. Well, then you, if you saw the movie, then you'd know the difference. <laughs> yeah, but I this, haven't. This so I'm like, is this bride. the same movie? I, it no. seems like it. You're acting no. like I would you guess not, it would be. Mike, you're acting like you don't realize that every single romantic comedy ends in a church and somebody rushes in and tries to stop the wedding. I mean, yeah, that's I not a typical that, fair. But, but that's not what happened here. It's not what happens. Yeah, they right. It's, it's the opposite. In a lot right. of ways, she's trying to she's trying to break everything up before the wedding, and then we're, we we got to watch this character grow over the space of four days and overcome her own ego and realize like shit, I really was just kind of like lashing out, and maybe I really do love him, but whatever the case, like if I really love him, I've got to let him go because he has found the love for his life, and that's why I love this movie so much. It's not just that she grows and lets him go; it's that she doesn't end up empty-handed. 
you know, there won't be there won't be marriage, there won't be sex, but God, but by God, there will be dancing. And you get the sense that George is going to be like, you know, a close friend of, of hers for the rest of her life and kind of fill that gap that Michael was for her. And I really oh, love that for God. a romantic comedy for it to come off and be like, no, the friendship is actually what the real thing is about at the end of the day. Not the love, not the romantic love, but the friendship. Well, that premise is correct. But how we get to that point is poorly done. It is. <laughs> it's shitty writing. They're trying to make it clever and very much make fun of the genre in a way, but also take you yeah. in different directions, which I appreciate. I'm all about that shit. But, you know, Julia Roberts in this movie, to me, she's kind of just... I, I'm very annoyed by her. I know she's supposed to be annoying because she's trying to break up a wedding first off. She's very selfish. Mm -hmm. But I'm not like, oh, I'm rooting for her. I really hope this works out at all. And I don't think it's supposed to. All of these moments, terrible, terrible. The fucking, uh, when they're on the boat, don't let this moment pass you by. Oh, we're on a boat. Oh, my God, through a fucking overpass bridge. Come on. That is so lame. That is not good enough I, it just I love that part I did too you love that part <laughs> yeah. I love that part why well, that was romantic I, I think <laughs> I, mean, I like got? well I like that scene too I mean to me I mean I like the way it's done because for one he's saying goodbye to her that whole day like let's be alone she's thinking like I'm gonna like this is my chance I'm gonna be able to turn him and in reality like he's, he is being sort of romantic with her but in, but he's like, it's all a big goodbye for him. If, he, if, if, he, if she would listen to him, he's saying goodbye to her. And he even gives her this chance. Kimmy says that if you really love someone, then you say it. So he knows. He's literally giving her that chance. Hey, don't do it at my fucking wedding. Do it now here if you're going to do it at all. And she doesn't and she doesn't take it, which, again, like I love that moment because she doesn't take it again. It's that look on her face afterwards as they get into the sunlight and you see her like trying not to show him how like disappointed she is in herself and her cowardice. I love it. I think it's a great scene. I like the way they use the city in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, they don't just like do like the landmarks and visit them and like, like everything kind of happens around them and like to them uh, without like spoon feeding you this, these locations. I dug that, but we got, we got yet another controversy here. It's Ronald Bass. This guy's canceled too. Oh, is uh -oh. <laughs> what happened? We got the writer of Rain Man, a fucking incredible screenplay. Oh, I knew, I knew, I knew the name. Uh, here's the controversy. Entrapment. He uses, Captain Zeta Jones's butt. Used to, yeah, oh, who could forget? Um, yeah, he, he got uh, accused of forcing his uh, secretaries and assistants to like write the screenplays for him. Like, and he just like oversaw everything. They called him the Ronettes. This is how known this controversy was in the industry. This guy's fucked. Well, yeah. his assistants did a fine job with this movie, in my opinion. It's so uh... scratching your head about that opening scene, wondering like, yeah, some fucking guy, white dude wrote this, Mike? You might be right, because it was a Ronettes all along. Oh. That would, that would explain a lot. I mean, it really seems like there's a lot of, I mean, I'm not a woman. What the fuck do I know about the woman's perspective? But it seems like a lot of that is accomplished in this, for, for coming from a male screenwriter and a male director. But like you and I, Travis, love romantic comedies, and it's no, it doesn't matter that we aren't female. We will wrap ourselves up in that blanket, get the pint of ice cream out, and watch this shit. Oh yeah, and with a house. I love all kinds face. of romantic comedies, so that but doesn't that doesn't mean, mean that this movie is that. Okay. I mean, you look at this film. You guys like Julia Roberts' performance. You say you, mm. you already mm. mentioned a few examples of what makes it stand out to you. Yeah. Uh, also, tons of smoking. Oh, tons of oh, smoking, yeah. man! People smoke like crazy. I was yeah. smoking. You, uh, oh. you guys weren't smoking. I was smoking. Everybody, everybody smoke. But be draft. Okay, let's go for a few things here. So the car, her driving like a psycho when she first meets Cameron Diaz. I'm like, oh, is this gonna come back later in the movie and she's gonna die and then they're gonna get married? I was wrong <laughs> about that one. I did not <laughs> nail that prediction. It didn't work no, that didn't. way. Mm. No, I thought it, I thought they were trying to set me up because it was so much of the shit was telegraphed that I'm like, okay, now what are they telegraphing to me here? I was really starting to read into a lot of shit. Also, uh, was that Aaron Sorkin at the dinner table on that? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, <laughs> that, I didn't see that. The message that she leaves to George, where she's going off, how pissed she was while the whole dinner party's listening. By the way, which I can see that actually happening. You're having a dinner party, and back in '97, you are using old school answering machines and yeah. she's going off and Aaron Sorkin's like, what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> this is a funny scene, actually. It was just a strange cameo. I wouldn't even say anything. But Trying to pretend like it's not happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is also 
these two incredibly gorgeous women and this yep. guy in, in these scenes where they're together the first one i think was when not the karaoke part it was the one where they she is going to try to tell him about his job and her desires what she wants to do with her life because mm. she was put up to it by julia roberts and the right. three of them the there and, while she's just sitting there watching them having this very heavy serious conversation where they get into a serious argument it's just so bizarre they would have like gone off in private for a minute or something i don't buy that they would sit there at a table and have this borderline we're throwing the wedding away argument right here well we get this <laughs> over the shoulder shot from dermot's perspective of julia roberts the whole time and i appreciate trying to create some cool shots and do something different, but that just seemed really forced to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> seems a little yeah. nitpicky to me, but all right. What? I, don't know. I think How that seems a little bit. I mean, you're 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 upset right now because there was a scene in a movie where people yelled each other and yelled at each other in a restaurant. How many fucking <laughs> times has that happened? No, you're movie? now you're changing it now. That's not well, that's what, what, I what happens. Said. That's literally what happens. People that yell is, at it's, it's a, a serious group. fight. Yeah, it is. Between those two. Why would she just be like, okay, guys, I'll give you a few minutes. No. She just sits there. Is like, what, what's yes, the point of giving yes, someone a few minutes yes. when they're out? What's the point of giving someone a few minutes when they're out in public? First of all, I, <laughs> you're at a fucking like uh, crab boil restaurant. Everybody's too concerned with breaking those goddamn legs and like figuring out how to eat the meat. No one's paying attention to the conversation. Maybe that's yeah. why they felt comfortable with it. Yeah, maybe that is why. Yeah, um, that makes a of lot crabs of sense. In the restaurant, we, the Dion Warbrick scene that we already referenced that that the moment I wake up, when the guys in the lobster claws in the back at, at the end of the, <laughs> the, the scene are like, are like I laughed. <laughs> that's one of my yeah, favorite parts laughed. of the movie. Actually, it's really funny. Terrible audio change though. Terrible dubbing on that song yeah. when it changes to. You can so clearly yeah. hear the shift when Rupert Everett starts sing singing. Live. Like, ooh. yeah, very few musicals sing live, but when they do, oh, yeah. it makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a hard thing to do. I admit that. I mean, I, I don't. And you, weren't, you wouldn't see that. Yeah, I don't know if, at like, I, I mean, not hardly at all in the 1990s live uh, recordings of a musical. I think they 90s. did it and everyone says, I love you. And it uh, was Oh, God, yeah. Well, forgot about that one. Yeah, we all tried to forget about that one. We, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> we mentioned earlier, though, that this movie does get serious, right? So there's this moment where things get really sentimental after some off the wall bozo shit has happened. And I, the transition <laughs> to that was, it was hard to go into that for me. I'm like, wow, this is, this, this is not flowing well for me as a viewer. And we were getting a lot of laughs and we're trying to cause hijinks, but then it's like on a very special, my best friend's wedding. And then it tries to go back to that shit, which is a, it's a really hard thing to do. So I do understand that. I don't know what to say. Like, I thought everything was balanced really well. And I like how that reviewer called it a, like a farcical romantic comedy because there's little weird <laughs> moments in here, like when they're singing in the helium balloon. That I, I was just moment. laughing out loud. And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? This is, a, this is a welcome surprise. Like, one of the things I like about this movie is it's kind of making fun of romantic comedies while at the same time totally being one. And mm -hmm. I thought the balance worked. Yeah, I think it's peppered with like like you just said. Like I love that little. That's one of the musical moments. The guy, but it's actually good the <laughs> yeah. way that they're singing. Like it's legitimately good. Yeah. Uh, and the movie has like all like in these moments. Like um, when the camera comes around back to that one scene that you hated, like when they're in the boat, like they're they're dancing to no music, and like it, the, and you see that there's like these two little girls that are actually like watching them from on the, on the other side of the boat. There's just all these little just little moments. Or say like the woman that plays Kimmy's mother. Um, like totally she's in like four scenes and mm -hmm. memorable and funny and like just like totally believable in every in every scene that she's in I just feel like there's a lot of depth to the movie while at the same time it skirts around being a cliched classic 1990s kind of romantic comedy with many familiar tropes but at the same time I think that we're getting all of this stuff that just makes me feel like this is a um it's, it's it's like it's, it really straddles the line between being just completely non-believable and being very believable to me. Well, speaking That's of the non-believable, how'd you feel, Mike, about that '90s internet email? Was that uh, <laughs> was that was that accurate? Yeah, uh, I didn't know way back then that you could save an email for later to have it scheduled to be sent out. That, that well, doesn't got, seem like that was I've going on. I've got four or five That's emails good. that I wrote and decided yeah. not to send. I've just yeah. saved them. I saved the yeah. draft so you could go in <laughs> yeah. later and, and send them collectively for yeah. me. Yeah, I'm not oh, sure. Oh, send those out thing. now. 
How convenient. I mean, what a fucking shitty thing she's doing there. And she knows what yeah. she's doing because she's questioning herself why she does it. But in the end, she's kind of stuck with it. She didn't totally bail on it. So it's like, oh, my God, this woman is uh, she's the bad this woman's guy. a little up. Yeah, she is yeah. a bad guy. There's no well, doubt about that. She, says, she says, I'm the bad guy. She, I mean, like, it's a meta moment she's talking about for the movie. I'm the yep. bad guy in this movie. <laughs> Maybe That's we true. should be more pissed. This this is homewrecker of the movie, and yet we're yeah. laughing. <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> and again, that's another reason why I think I'm talented, Mr. Ripley, because it's it all shows like the power of perspective. Whoever you're following is who you're going to root for, typically. That's a really I mean, good point. Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. That is a good point. Also, this movie the, could have been made with um, the. I'm sorry, real quick, but the movie could have easily been made with the protagonist being Kimmy, and it would have been just a completely trite, forgettable thing. But instead, they went this different route, which is one of the things I've always liked about it. Does it, Mike? Hmm. Does this work with the same cast, uh, but a but a thriller instead of, instead of a romantic comedy? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Somebody yeah, should do one some... of those trailers, like when they made Miss Doubtfire a horror movie. Like make this a fucking like thriller horror. I could totally see Funny. it. Man. There's Funny something there. Sleeping with the enemy. This is no joke. <laughs> no, that's I've a never shitty tried, movie. I've never tried to break up a. a a marriage for my own personal unrequited reasons. No, well, I came close one time. One time I came real close. <laughs> really? One time I was seriously thinking about trying to break up this marriage because I was in love with this woman. And I, this was my plan. This was like a straight, but maybe I shouldn't say this. I'm going to it anyway. This was like a straight buttoned up Christian man, family man. Mm. So I'm like, how am I going to do this? So I plotted it out. And I, and I thought, well, if I could somehow, like, hire a, pro, what do we say, sex worker to, like, yeah. uh, seduce this guy and sleep with him, that won't, uh, that won't sit right with his wife, and then I can leak it, and then they will split up. <laughs> I wonder if that would have worked. That's a, a lot of fun ideas here, I must say. This I gotta give you guys credit for that. Uh, stunning <laughs> admission uh, here on yeah. the Cinema 9 podcast. I, um shocked I, yeah that wow <laughs> i don't know what to also, say i thought you were joking most of the time no i'm serious kept, so yeah i make a pretty now. good screenplay if i put a little woody allen spin on this this could work i appreciate well, candor and i like your ideas and now that you've seen this movie you realize oh i can't be the pro protagonist in this film <laughs> hey <laughs> yeah, i decided not to do it though good call there's no <laughs> doubt though i could not escape from a there's a reference on Family Guy about a busy business lady who's going to have all her problems solved by the man's penis. I just could not get that oh. out of my head. I, I paused the movie and went and watched it like five times in a row and laughed my fucking ass off. And that's every rom-com, though, so this isn't like a unique situation to yeah. this movie. It's just funny. It's a really funny bit. It makes all sense in the world on many meta levels. But people who own baseball teams are assholes they are not nice people no way so that's i guess that bothers me because owners in mlb are some of the biggest pricks that ever existed in the united states and i guess this guy was way philip bosco being way too friendly uh, for my taste which is He's not the end man. of the world it was yeah it was really hard for me to especially we know that the truth about the real owner of the chicago white Sox, jerry reinsdorf hall of fame scumbag a total piece <laughs> of shit just google it and you'll find out a lot of reasons for why that is not the biggest deal but again having some familiarity with baseball it did it took me out of it i was like ah, oh, i cannot let this go and that's my fault i admit that i'm like the chicago white Sox. Yeah, the Southsiders. Not, that's I right. Know what you're talking about? Yeah, Eric knows. Oh, come on, Eric used to live there. Soccer. <laughs> Soccer. <laughs> Competitive swimming. That's a good one. Uh, and then uh, he, the cat call. What God I always got to do the cat fight call out. That was that was funny. Classic '90s, of course. So I like that whole scene because it, again, like it. Um, it really shows that Kimmy is the hero here. <laughs> Kimmy is the, the whole crowd is like the, the the women in the in the restroom kind of represent us, the audience, being like, "You kissed him on his wedding day? Like what the fuck?" Tramp, right? Like <laughs> the, the, like saying what, what we kind of want to say to her a little bit, and then is that what that is? That's what I got out of it. And then um, when for Kimmy to like break down and end up hugging her, and that's and again like another really powerful thing for me about this movie is Kimmy is just as sweet as they come. She's just like a genuinely good, nice, caring character. I mean, maybe a little naive and uh, you know uh, starry eyed, but she yeah, is just like jello. Like, <laughs> she wants to be jello. She could be jello. <laughs> you could never be jello. <laughs> but uh, 
yeah, I love that she hugs her in the end and, you know, just like, again, prioritizes Michael. Not, not doesn't hug her because she's like, oh, I forgive you, but because she's like, okay, you are doing the right thing here. Finally, get me to the guy I'm trying to marry. Okay. But what is that scene doing then, though? The scene in the bathroom, it's all women. There's some type of meditation on something going on in there, but I, I didn't really find exactly what it was. I could have took a few guesses at it, a few stabs at it, but... Uh, again, it kind of felt like I was watching a movie at that point. It was written by boomer white dudes, and they were trying to like be women and get inside the head of women. But if, of course, if these Ronettes existed, so maybe I'm just misguided on that approach now. I'm really baffled. I'm Notice. very baffled. Muddy the waters. It, yeah, I was like, it wasn't terrible, but I just got a little confused by it. But what wasn't confusing was that tossing of the bouquet. I have never seen a more absurd tossing of the bouquet scene in movie history they were so intense and there were so many women it was it was bonkers it looked like a bunch of hippos like on the fucking sahara in africa and not because they're fat just like it was just like imagine all these animal zebras trying to drink water at once in africa it was just wild it was really weird we gotta talk about uh rachel griffiths playing in, uh, in this movie this is two years before six feet under and here mm-hmm. she's playing like this this just like completely like the total opposite character of Brenda from, from six feet under, like couldn't, couldn't be more different, like the polar opposite. It took me years to realize that was Rachel Griffiths. She's she, Griffiths. She's actually pretty damn good in this blonde hair, the sluts, the two Southern sluts is what it, what <laughs> what they were labeled suck as. it up the fucking ice sculpture and get <laughs> no pictures, please, <laughs> please. No pictures. <laughs> Funny. I don't know, Mike, Dude, I'm pushing back on this uh, white guy boomer stuff here. Uh, I defend this screenplay. I defend that scene in the bathroom. Like, it would have been the easy thing for the white boomer writer to do would be to have all the women uh, scream and run out because they're they're nurturing and they can't handle violence. But they're mm. competitive women at a sporting event in the in the bathrooms, ready mm-hmm. to uh, see a conflict through. I got no problems. Yeah, I, I like that scene. It's better than, I mean, like, it, they, they have to have it out, the two of them. Mm-hmm. And I actually find it better to have them have it out in front of a bunch of strangers. And it's more unique because otherwise, what else, where else would they would have had it out in public? It would have been at the fucking reception or at the wedding itself in front of all of our familiar characters, which that would have been so, I mean, you want to talk about cliched and tried yeah. and true and tropey to like move it and put it in a fucking bathroom with a bunch of strangers. I thought, I thought was an interesting choice. And we're also supposed to believe maybe that's the hard part about this film is that we're on the inside. We're seeing everything. We're the viewer, you know, Mm. we're absorbing the whole film, but it's hard to buy that these three entangled in this mess are that clueless about each other's feelings completely. There's one part there later towards the end. I wrote this down. He has no idea that she loves him. He had no idea. Nine years, Uh. nine years of him basically throwing himself at her. Right. That's what, that's what the impression I get from this movie. Nine years of him being like, look, I am here. You want to make this happen. I'm ready. Let's do it. I'm ready to get back, get back together at any time. And that's why he answers the phone, even still when he's engaged. This is high, beautiful and that kind of stuff, because he's so used to talking to her in this like sexual kind of flirty way. And so he's tried and he's been trying. Right. And he never would. And, and it's classic. I mean, how many guys have I spoken to? I've never been married, but I've spoken to a lot of guys that say as soon as they put that ring on, they're suddenly fucking irresistible to women. And um, and all of a sudden. Right. So like he didn't know that all of a sudden she was going to like turn around. And and so he's like trying to like do the same thing he's always done with her. But I've got a question for you guys. So for me, Rupert Everett is George. That's how I know Rupert Everett. I mean, I've seen Cemetery Man and I've saw that Christopher Walken, (laughs) Paul Schrader movie. But like, so who is, if you guys never saw this movie, who is, when you think of Rupert Everett, which role comes to mind? What do you think of? I got nothing. nothing. Right. I got his face is very unfamiliar to me. It really is. Yep, yeah, because he's fucking George. This is the role of his career. I mean, this is like, this is him. He's fucking George. We got to talk about Rupert Everett a little bit more because this was, I mean, there was Birdcage and there's some other gay characters uh, on in, in film at the time, but he is openly gay. There is still like the kind of like thing where he's kind of trying to like pretend like he's not for, um, you know, he pretends that he's straight for her and that kind of stuff. But even still, like, he's playing with it, making jokes. And she, the way she's, like, downplayed, he's like, you know, will do, got it. He's immediately, love the shirt, love the bag, <laughs> love everything. I think that he's, I mean, like, there is some kind of um, 
uh, maybe stereotypical things that he's doing here, but he's a gay man playing a gay man in a film and a time when you didn't really get a lot of that. And he is the most fun and funniest and most exciting character in the film. And ultimately hmm. he's like the, he's what salvages her right in that final scene by, by coming back and showing up the way, you know, the way, he, like, you know, again, like he is the real prize, um, you know, surprising her when being on the phone and all that kind of stuff to, to make that character. So, paramount to the telling of this story i think was not something you saw a lot at the time and he kills it yeah i guess uh you're right about the gay man playing gay character representation it definitely was unusual for that time or more rare and obviously compared to today that's changed but other than that i uh i just thought he was kind of like blah I was like okay this guy's mm. he's not doing a terrible job but I also could see why he doesn't really have a career beyond what he, I don't know, maybe he thought he should have after doing this movie and doing well in the role. He, he does a good job. I don't find him to be as charismatic as you did, I guess. So. Mm. Yeah. Listen, we got some funny lines here and some funny sequences with George. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, the late 90s, we started to see gay characters that weren't just jokes or victims. But... Um, but <laughs> but this is the same like I hate to compare it, but it's the same year as George uh, Greg Kinnear does Simon and as good as it gets. And that's a character. Oh. That's, yeah, it's gay, a gay dude, but he's not just the supportive gay friend that cracks joke and seems like he has no shortcomings. Uh, that's a character with foibles mm, and, and yeah. idiosyncrasies that that make him seem human. This mm -hmm. just kind of seems like the gay friend equivalent of like the magical black guy you know what i mean you know yeah. what i'm getting at i get yeah and i think that, the, that you're making a totally valid point i i hear what you're saying really but um, it's the same here too by the way very different Scotty. movies Ve very different movies though right i mean uh and, and also very different characters in as good as it gets greg kinnear is the is the like the third lead and I suppose, you know, he, you know, George is the third or fourth here, but still like the whole vibe of the movie is different. There's no one like trying to overcome home invasion trauma in this movie, <laughs> for instance. It's just not True. that kind of movie. But yeah, you're right. There, I mean, he is a little bit, um, well, no, he's a lot surface. He's a very surface character, but enchanting to me. I think he's yeah. fun. And I love that ending, but that phone call is like three minutes too long. It's like three <laughs> minutes too long. <laughs> I don't Shall know. Hey, oh, Dermot mm. Moroni. Is this guy? Hey! Is this guy? Pat, that, how you many guys do know how to pronounce his name, right? No. No. Der, Dermot Moroni. Dermo. No, I've never tried Wait, to figure whoa, that out. Whoa, I'm going to call whoa. him Dermot forever. Yeah. I will double check, but I've, I I'm 95% sure it's Dermo Moroni. It's the two <laughs> silent. I don't know. I'll, I'll look it need up. I need confirmation. Dermot Moroni for me in this, we don't really see why they're fighting over him. He just is handsome and polite. He doesn't really mm -hmm. do anything that makes him that um, desirable. Am I wrong here? No, you're right. It's not. He's not bad or totally lame, but yes. Why? Again, that's why I brought up the premise of these these beautiful women with a lot of pizzazz and multiple attributes that a man would desire, that someone would desire to have. And this guy is caught in between it for no reason beyond his experience with Julia's character, and then we're told just the about. sudden infatuation. Yeah. Okay. With Cameron. You know, mm -hmm. she, Cameron Diaz's character, she's 20, right? She's just she's yeah, still in 20. college. 20. Yeah. She can't even drink legally, technically. That does matter. All I know is that I have been mispronouncing this man's name since 1997, at least. Yeah, you guys are right. It's Dermot. Dermot. Hey! Yeah. I, I don't know where I got Dermo from, but I've been saying it since I saw <laughs> this movie. And I've always called him that. Dermo. Matt I mean, I probably, you know, in my house, I probably said, how do you pronounce this guy's name? And my mom was like, I don't know, Dermo or something. I don't know. I don't know. You almost upset my reality. Uh, I was like, I've what? I've been saying Dermo for you. fucking 30 years or whatever, 25 years. <laughs> yeah. Go well. Oh, it, all right. Now I know. He's, he's also, he does a, he came back with Julia Roberts when they did uh, August Osage County back in 2014. <laughs> yeah. They did a little reunion yeah. on that movie. Laugh fast. Laugh oh, fast. Hilarious. It's a fucking hilarious movie. It really is. Oh, comedy. But. He also, he's just like a kind of rugged looking dude. He can clean up and look nice too. He's a handsome fella. And he's sure. got, he's had his moments in his career. Like I, I've enjoyed, I, 
Bash Club That's a good call. That's a great call. I was thinking (laughs) when I was watching the movie, I did this a few times. Because he's in Young Guns. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is. Spirituality uh, scene where they take the peyote. You see the size of that chicken? (laughs) I kept doing that like... Got all that chaw in his mouth. You see see that chicken? Yeah, it's hard to believe that that dude is the same, like dude in the tuxedo that is in oh, this dude, film. Not even that. What about a lot of people think it's a pyramid scheme, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, about Schmidt. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Good old Dermot. He's well, yeah, I don't know. He's Dermot. just a handsome guy, handsome guy in this movie. I'm not, I could have used a big, I could have used a little something more. Like Richard Gere comes in here and it's like, oh, automatic charisma, like you know who you're dealing with. This just kind of seems like handsome guy. I, I like how flawed he is and, um, because he is pretty flawed, the, the way that he's openly flirting with his friend um, throughout much of this. Like, he, he is not a great guy. And he's fine, like, in a way with, like, his with his uh, wife throwing away her education to follow him around. Like, he's not a great guy. He's a good guy. But he's not a great guy. So I, I like that. You know what I mean? I like that he's not some sort of, he's not George. He's not this flat character that you could just be like, oh, I see why she loves him. Like, no, there's some things about him. You're kind of like, ah, this guy he can use some work. <laughs> also, uh, Danny Masterson's brother from the Malcolm in the Middles in this movie. And then I thought of Danny Masterson and I got impressed. <sighs> so. That is him. Yeah, he plays the brother. Yeah. That's right. Not his fault. No. Well, shall we? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Travis, go ahead. Oh, uh, one other thing I said here. I said that uh, Julia Roberts is a worse friend to him than Michael Caine was as a father to his son in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. But will Dermot try and shoot her? Um, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> Give me a tough one. If there's a 50 cal gun hanging around, anything's possible. So, <laughs> so I chose this movie. Kill the wedding and- party. <laughs> Yeah, so um, for me, <laughs> this movie holds up, man, and I love it. I love to watch a movie like this that I that I loved growing up, haven't seen in a couple decades, and sit down and watch it again and be like, not only does this hold up, it holds up better than I expected. This is a better <gasps> movie than I remember it being. I think it's a lot more complex. I think it's a lot more challenging. I think it's a lot more goofy and surreal and. Mm. Um, and tangential and just kind of like experimental in ways that I kind of had hadn't realized because I kind of normalized it as a kid, I guess it's a lot, it's a lot more uh, bold of a film than I, I think it gets credit for, even as it does walk through these familiar paths and, and, and play with these familiar tropes. Um, I love Julia Roberts. I always will love Julia Roberts. I'll watch pretty much anything she does. And this is prime Julia Roberts, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. Um, and again, just the the way that she carries this movie is, again, it just it's just those subtle facial expressions that she makes throughout. She just is, uh, I think she's a master actor. Um, and uh, I still love this movie. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have... The same affinity you do, Travis, for Julia Roberts. I'm not uh, anti Julia Roberts. She's had a lot of great roles and she's performed quite well. But, you know, there, it's hard for me. This is one of those old bits where to each their own. But, you know, you separating the reality of the person versus who they are, what they've done, and the decisions they've made in their lives versus the actor and their performance or the, the artist and their art. And I guess, uh, I don't know, I got, she seems like kind of a shitty person possibly and it's maybe. always kind of stuck with me and yeah, i'm learning something from the recent p diddy stuff i always thought that guy was a piece of shit but i didn't say it enough and now i'm like damn it i wish i'd said that more often because that guy <laughs> was a piece of shit he is not that julie roberts is p diddy that's not fair at all let's not make these uh, totally unfounded but, <laughs> accusations about julia <laughs> you're right I, I can't go there um also, uh, you know, the cinematography done by laszlo uh oh, kovacs legendary yeah the legend rich beautiful yeah, I mean, it's not a... There's good shots in this movie, and it's it's done in a way... Technically, it's not mind-blowing, but it definitely doesn't take you out of the movie in any point at all. That means they do a good job with this type of film. But I just thought the writing sucked, and I, kn- I know that they're... If I had seen this movie, and this... You know, cue the tape on this one, because I've said it, you <laughs> it guys is. have said it. Nostalgia, I didn't have it. It's the first time I'm seeing this now. I was a 43-year-old man in 2024, even though it came out in 1997 when I was 16 going on 17. And that probably has something to do with it. But if I liked it, I liked it. I would say it. But this movie, 
I thought it sucked. I thought this movie sucked ass. I thought the the writing was lame. The, I mean, the performances are solid, but so much telegraph shit here. And what we talked about already, saying that, hey, this is a fine line, very difficult to pull off this, you know, critique of these types of films while being that film. Then basically, I think that makes it pretty obvious whether you thought this movie was good or not because they were able to pull off that premise or they were not able to. I say they were not able to. I thought this movie sucked, and I really don't plan to watch it again. Sorry. I forgive you. Thank you. <laughs> the Ronettes give you a pass, Mike. <laughs> Listen, before I turned this water. on, I was like, oh, man, what's with this pick? I'm not going to have anything to say about this <laughs> fluffy romantic comedy. I'm tired. I can't do this. I turned it on, and from the first scene, I was... Uh, Getting that cozy feeling that I miss from late '90s romantic comedies. And I gotta tell you, man, um, I just like the movie a lot. I, I'm, I kind of love this movie. All right. Um, like the karaoke scene That's had me cool. chuckling because, yeah, she's bad. Like literally, a dude in the back just goes, "Shut up, <laughs> <laughs> you suck." <laughs> But, like, they warm up to her, and they realize, you know what, she's trying. She seems like a sweet person, and everyone's happy. Even and Julia. I, I just, and even Julia. like, And that's like, and, and then she, yeah, even Julia. It's like, you know, I was wrong, and I'm okay with that. I'm not still pissed. I just, again, I'm going to try to find a different way to break up this marriage. <laughs> um, but I kind of miss movies that aren't, um, I don't know how to phrase it, like ugly or mean spirited, I guess that that tends to bother me these days. Like uh, I, I was chuckling, man. And, and this doesn't seem typical to me. Like I said, it kind of seems like a parody of romantic comedies, but it's also a really sweet romantic comedy in and of itself about friendship and choices. Um, it, I think it's bold to have someone go about destroying a, a relationship and kind of knowing how much of a dick they are and, it being cool and everyone still being friends uh, at mm -hmm. the end of it is kind of what I'm getting at here. Uh, I dig this film, man. Uh, it seems like the kind that like I would watch. Oh, it, I think I'd be with you. It seems like very rewatchable re for me. I don't know what Mike, Mike's talking about. I kind of wanted to watch it again right when it was over. Here, here. All right. You guys can Holds watch it together me. anytime. You should. I will definitely watch it again. That up. Yeah. I, it be won't be touch. 20 years before I watch it again. And uh, next touch. time I watch it again, we'll maybe do it together. Bring Why the not? crab legs. <laughs> Fuck no, I don't eat uh, sea spiders. No thanks. Oh, man. Sounds good to me. No. All right, well, there it is. It's in the can. Cinema 9 Pod does my best friend's wedding. That was Travis's pick. This is episode 188, cinema 9 pod at gmail.com. We got our reviews. Click on the YouTube subscribe. Videos are posted there uh, every week. We're up to date on that. Before we go, mm. Dave Horning's favorite part of the show, the show, the moment of the show that Dave waits for yeah, every week. Yeah, come back. <laughs> Hit yeah. stop, Dave. Here you go. <laughs> Yeah, um, I got to tell you, we're going back to open water, Mike, uh, for you island oh! fans. Okay, we're going back to open water. We're going yeah. back to the beautiful year 1990 for a movie that, if I may use a pun oh, here, boy. made a big splash. Yep. But I haven't heard anyone talk about this movie in like 30 years. Somebody From did director recently. John McTiernan, The Hunt for Red October. Somebody did recently. We, and on Palazzo, uh, actually, when Steve, a friend of the show from Is It Safe and who's guested on the show, uh, somebody brought up The Hunt for Red October a couple weeks really? ago on Palazzo. What? We had a big moment about what this term meant. and uh, But I'm, you're right. It's not as um, talked about maybe as Patriot Games, maybe or not. I don't know. That's a good debate we'll have as well. Right. We yeah, dipped our a long toe time. To Tom Clancy. <laughs> Tom Clancy! <laughs> Some of all fears. Who cares? Yeah. yeah. Cool. I don't know. All right. Hmm. Sounds good. That's a that's a great choice. Yeah, I look forward to doing this one. And I thought you were saying yeah. open water, like the movie Open Water. I'm like, oh, great call. <laughs> no way Eric would say it that quickly. He's got to give us a build up. So yeah. nice job, Eric. <laughs> we're going back to the ocean. Woohoo! And we'll do so next time on this wonderful show called Cinnamon Eye Pod for Travis and Eric. I'm Mike, and we will say so long. You can never be jello. No pictures. <laughs> jello.